Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you enjoy this legal education content, and today is the day I earn that subscription. For today's story, we're talking about recent changes to the Electoral Count Voting Act. So this is an act of Congress that determines how electoral votes for the United States president are to be counted. And this act has not been revised since the mid-19th century. And one of the things that happened in the 2020 election was there are a lot of parts about the act that showed themselves to maybe need some revision. And there was a lot of debate about these revisions. Well, the United States Congress just passed the changes to the Electoral Count Act as part of the budget. I know it seems like a strange thing, but it was in there along with like everything else because that's how they do things. But in any case, they have made changes to the Electoral Count Act that a lot of people think might have might present prevent some of the problems that emerged as a result of the 2020 election and election counting process and clarify some things as a matter of law. So let's go ahead and cover the changes that have been made to the Electoral Count Act. Okay, number one thing that the thing does is it clarifies election day. Right now, presidential elections take place on the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November, but existing law allows states to choose presidential lectures on a later day if they fail to make a choice on that day. So there was a provision of the law. It said it, the election day on the first Tuesday of the first Monday had been established already, but it had this little proviso that states could choose electors on some later date for failing to make a choice. And then the question is, well, what does that mean? Was it failed to make a choice? And the old law didn't define it. This provision was designed in the mid-19th century for the few states that had runoff elections if no candidate received a majority. But no state used it for that purpose today. So one of the things it did was, you know, well, if you have runoff elections, but no state has runoff elections anymore. Some states divvy up their votes, not all winner takes all. Some divvy it up based on congressional districts like Maine and Nebraska. But no state uses the runoff provisions. So the, this provision left this open question, what does it mean for a state to make to fail to make a choice? What does that mean? Because it didn't, it didn't really specify. Some advocates in 2020 suggested that abstract questions about voter fraud or absentee ballots could constitute such a failure and mean that a state could choose its electors at a later date. So one of the things is like, oh, well, maybe it's just up to them to determine what it means to fail to make a choice. This raised the prospect that a state might send two slates of electors a slate for candidates who carried the vote, and another slate chosen by the legislature. And that would invite Congress to undermine the popular vote by potentially counting the second round of votes. So one of the things that the, one of the, things the Constitution says is it's up to each state to choose the electors, and they can choose that by method other than voting, incidentally. So this doesn't change that. It just says that it has to happen on Election Day. Whatever happens on Election Day can't be artificially changed. That's what the new law says. So States can make the election, but they have to make it in advance. That's basically what it has to do. So Congress has closed this door by saying there's one date of elections and says that state legislatures cannot show up after the election and change the rules. Now, I will take note here that there is a provision in the law that allows for states to change election day for uh, acts of God, basically. So if there is some act of God, like a hurricane or tornado or whatever that causes election day to not happen because of this natural disaster, then they can do it for that reason. So election day can be moved or changed in the event of this cataclysmic natural disaster, but not for other reasons. So it at least narrows down the grounds for which election day can be moved off of election day. So election day is the drop dead day, you know, barring the situation. So it clarifies that language. Okay. So what else does the, the thing do? Well, it also ensures timely and accurate appointment of electors. In past years, disputes about which votes should or should not be counted rages for weeks after election day. A federal court in Pennsylvania, for instance, rejected a lawsuit that claimed hundreds of thousands of absentee ballots should be thrown out because they processed them differently than one another. This is somewhat akin to Florida from the 2000 election, right? Different counties count them differently. So a similar argument there. The Electoral Count Reform Act creates a firm date for states to, sass, to ratify the elections and therefore creates a speedy end to any litigation by creating a drop dead date. Some Trump supporters attempted to file rogue paperwork purporting to represent an alternate slate of electors from a purported state. The act limits such mischief through expedited judicial review and clear obligations for state officials to submit accurate results. 
It requires state officials to certify only the results that match the outcome on election day and nothing else. And it has to be certified by the governor of each state, according to that. So, and also provides that in the event of a dispute is to be heard by a three member federal court and therefore would provide for expedited handling because if there's going to be an appeal, it would be to the U.S. Supreme Court directly. So it allows for a step to be skipped in the middle by having the three-person panel. What other changes does it do? Well, another thing it does is it changes the objection threshold. When Congress met in January 6th to count the electoral votes, it's typically ceremonial. But since the 2000 presidential election, some Democrat and Republican lawmakers have objected or attempted to object to counting at least some electoral votes. Debate ensued both in 2005 and 2021, which forced the chambers to separate and conduct two hours of debate over to whether to count the vote. So we've seen this before, right? We've seen members of both parties do this. Members of the members get up and say, you know, I object to the counting. And in some cases, they didn't have the requisite number, but in some cases they did because the requisite number was one member of each house. So open debating required one member of each house. So even then they couldn't meet that threshold. But because of the last election where they were able to make the threshold, they changed it to one-fifth of the members. So now to have a successful objection, you don't need a majority, but you just need one-fifth. So one party can still do it alone, but you need one-fifth of each house. So you need 20 members, 20 senators to sign off on this thing. So, you know, that's a lot and therefore changes it from trivial to not trivial. So it's a lot harder to object now. So that is one of the changes that was made. The last significant change, although not necessarily the only change, but the last significant change was to change the vice president's power, at least further define it. In 2021, Trump publicly and privately pressured Pence to refuse to count the electoral votes. Pence would, didn't do what he wanted, arguing he knew had no power to do so. The act further clarifies this role is purely ceremonial. The update is up, the language updates what's already known. The vice president has no unilateral power. So the statute was a bit unclear on this point. You could still try to argue some sort of constitutional power, but it really doesn't work. Just to say that the vice president, the say the vice president is the president of the Senate doesn't necessarily give him any independent role. And so this is just to say, well, yeah, you can't do anything other than ceremonial. So this is the big four changes that has done this. So this goes a long way to reforming some of the ambiguities that were brought up by the uh, old Electoral Act, which hadn't been updated since the 1900s or 19th century, rather. Thus, that brings us to the end of the story about the Electoral Count Act, which has been reformed to make some changes a little bit clearer in the law, to make clearer that elections have to happen by Election Day, and they can't happen some other time. States are still free to choose their electors any way they want but they have to make those choices in advance and they can't change it after the fact. Ratification must be done by the governor in accordance with the law as it's further specified. And the vice president's role is purely ceremonial and any objection to the slate of electors must come from a fifth of each house rather than a single member of each house. So, so these changes will go a long way to helping to prevent future shenanigans on January 6th. And at least for a moment, that brings us to the end of discussion of this case.